Hello. Can you see my presentation? Uh, yes. Yes. Yes, we see you. Hi. <clears throat> so, um, my name is Colin Murray. Uh, I'm speaking to you from Ireland, and I'm going to talk to you about a project that I have been involved with for many years. Um, in the first place, I want to explain perhaps the two organizations that are represented on this screen. I work for the Heritage Council in Ireland. It's an advisory uh, body that um, gives advice to the government about what heritage is. Um, heritage is an, a new concept in Ireland. Yes, we have conservation, etc. is intended to provide policy advice to the government about how heritage can be managed and especially how it can be considered holistically uh, and coherently. As well as addressing the government, we also engage with communities uh, to ensure that they too are supported in taking care of heritage. Um, that means local communities of place, but also all sorts of organizations that are involved with heritage. One of these organizations is the Roth House Trust. Uh, the relationship between the Heritage Council and the Roth House Trust is very close. Our offices used to be in this building. And for this reason, perhaps, <laughs> one of the first actions of the Heritage Council was to create a conservation plan for the building in accordance with the Borough Charter, Australian ICOMOS. And um, that set out a long time frame uh, management approach to the building. It's a uh, a very special building, very old in Ireland. It dates back to 1594 and extraordinarily has been in continuous use since then for all sorts of reasons. My presentation is going to um, describe very briefly um, that long history and the attempts to discover and hold on to its uh, special historic character and um, what they may mean for, for us today. If you can see my screen, this is the um, conservation plan for Roth House. If you're good with Google, you will be able to find it on the web. And um, this is a brief description of uh, a burgage plot within the medieval city of Kilkenny that has become the subject matter and the property of the Roth House Trust. The medieval buildings are at the top northeast end of the plot and through recent actions the remaining um, two-thirds of the burgage plot has been reunited with those buildings and a garden um, reinstated in accordance with archaeological evidence and what we imagine um, was grown in a medieval garden. So this is some, these are some of the achievements of uh, the Roth House Trust in the last few years. This is the building as it is seen in some um, street context. Uh, it's extraordinary uh, because it has an open arcade at the base. Uh, this was a feature of medieval Kilkenny and is an important indicator that at this particular time, at the end of the 16th century, Kilkenny was a peaceful place capable of engaging in international trade. And um, for us in Ireland, this is the threshold moment when the Renaissance appears in Ireland. Prior to this, and across much of the rest of the country, we have defensive structures, or very, very um, uh, temporary structures that were places where people lived. We have uh, castles and tower houses. But here, within the walls of the city, 
it was possible for the building to reach the ground with an arcade open to the public for commercial purposes. Also, you can see some of the characteristics of 16th century architecture, uh, a declamatory form, uh, the gables, the windows, the oriel window. These are the signifiers of wealth and importance for this building. This is the interior, um, now arranged as a museum uh, of a local history collection. Um, and uh, these are the high points of what the project in the last uh, 15 years attempted to do with this building. Um, it had just under 15,000 visitors per annum and tourism funding was being made available to increase that number to 40,000 uh, visitors per annum. And this was a... a, a, a difficult prospect and the rest of this presentation uh, or the impact that that proposal had on the fact was to um, create full accessibility for all members of the public to the house and gardens and to tell the story of the family as we understood it and as well as that to ensure that the um, special characteristics uh, of the house and garden were conserved, protected um, and that their values were remained intact. So that, that was the challenge. I'm going to describe a little now about the history of the conservation of the building. I understand the theme of this conference is restoration of restoration. And there are many interesting um, dimensions to what happened to this building since it was discovered in the middle of the 19th century. In fact, in the year 1849, uh, Church of Ireland clergyman, who was very interested in medieval things, discovered the arches of this building and linked them to its ancient foundations and got quite excited about the, um, the survival of this building. At that time, a plan was made of the building. It was in what we call tenements, um, was essentially housing and rooms rented to the very poor on a week-to-week -week basis. Um, naturally, because of that, in um, very poor condition, and also um, because of that, socially charged with a negative charge, it would have been the place where the dispossessed... Um, paupers from the famine or emigrating or going to the poor house. And so it had a very negative social connotations at this time. And for the Reverend Grave to point to its noble past was perhaps uh, um, shocking. Uh, so this is the earliest photograph that we have of the building uh, before any restoration works commence to it. For example, we can see no oriel window that was later reinstated. And the, as I say, this is a place where poor people lived. Um, and these are some, um, I'm not sure if these people are the poorest people who lived at that time there, um, but some indication of relatively difficult conditions, um, people in barefoot, for example, in the photograph on the right. So the first phase of um, recognition and conservation of this building was to see it as something that was significant, historical and deserving of attention. That did not lead to any physical changes being made to the fabric. It was only 50 years later when this man, Timothy O'Hanrahan, came along um, at a time when nationalism was resurgent in Ireland, when Catholics were becoming 
more affluent and seeking greater rights for uh, their culture and religious recognition and for um, opportunities to uh, thrive in the economic system. Um, and this man uh, looked backwards at Roth House. Um, I show him here in his, his own chosen uh, portrait and he's beside um, an inscribed sign uh, that he had made when he restored the house. It's written in Irish and it's written in the most arcane possible um, Irish script. And what he's saying is in that, in that notification, he says, direct your prayers for Timothy O'Hanrahan, whether you are dead or alive. He renovated and extended this house in the year of the age of Christ, 1898. And I think this is tremendously significant. Here's a, a wealthy lawyer um, who rescues the house, and this is his declared motive for doing so. It's religious and it's historic. And um, he made quite radical changes to the house, but he did so in order for it to be inhabitable. And he lived there. And indeed, he offered space in the house for one of Kilkenny's first museums. Um, when thinking about how the house was transformed by this man, and subsequently, I'm reminded of the words of an eco-feminist called Laurie Gruen, who reaches for what I think is quite a profound truth when she says, facts are laden with theory and theories are value laden and values are molded by historical and philosophical ideologies, social norms and individual processes of categorization. Now, what does that mean? It means that facts are made by the things that are inside our heads, the ideas we have about what we're doing. And these in their turn are generated by the circumstances uh, and the social um, awareness that is around us. And for this man, restoring the building, as he described it, um, was an attempt to regain for a Catholic Ireland one of its ancient um, and important monuments. In doing so, he made quite radical transformations of the building, and this is how it looked in 1950, um, after his works were completed. It was plastered, the oriel window was reinstated, part of the ground floor was converted into shops, and he placed um, what we call neo-Tudor hood mouldings over the windows. We actually have a very accurate description of how the building was in 1852 from the very tentative sketches of a clergyman uh, who visited and called it Roth's house. Um, these can be compared with um, accurate archaeological survey drawings done more recently. And if you look to the top left of the elevation of this drawing, you can see just how much Timothy O'Hanrahan transformed the building. We have a, a two-story, two-bay building, and it converts into a three-story, four-bay building. And by the addition are the raising of the walls and the extension to the left-hand side. So when we look at this building and visit it now, it becomes difficult to detect these additions. Um, it takes the practiced eye of an archeologist and a building um, bow washer, someone who uh, understands how to look carefully at buildings for evidence um, to detect uh, what has, how it has evolved. And we get reconstruction drawings like this, which imagine the building Uh, is as old as, and this is a photograph from 15 years ago of the same elevation. 
Everything to the top and to the left of the building here is modern. I'm not sure if you can see my pointer. Now, I love this building and I could talk at great length about it, um, <laughs> but uh, how its history is, uh, unfolds in its historic fabric, but I'll try to, to move on. Um, this is building as it was at the time when a second phase of restoration occurred. In the 1960s, an organization called the Kilkenny Archaeological Society bought the building with the purposes of restoring it and opening it to the public and using it as their headquarters. And they um, engaged the system to do a good restoration. Um, and so we had a survey of the building at that time. And this is the condition that the building was in, in 1962. I imagine some of the timbers uh, in this structure are original from the 1590s. Um, but they were removed and the roof was replaced. And so in its place, we have the image of a medieval roof, um, which appeared to the architects in the, 18, in the 1960s to be more um, important than reality of maybe drab evidence of uh, older, only rafters and lath and plaster. So in case of the authenticity of the found materials, we have a rather magnificent and showy roof built in the style of um, medieval carpentry, but not in fact relating to the evidence that was to be found on the site at that time. One could suggest that this is design and not conservation. Look at um, one of the houses at the rear of the building. Um, this is how it was in 1990, a ruin. This is how it was in 1850, uh, when it was pauper's apartments. And this is how it was restored. And in fact, when I began to work for the Heritage Council, this is the building that I worked in. So in a funny way, this was home for me for um, three years. Now, you can see the surface of the courtyard uh, in this photograph. It's cobbled with um, quite a lot of indentations, very difficult to walk across in high-heeled shoes. In recent times, some of those difficulties were earned out by the introduction of timber boarding such as this um, to make to overcome the barrier that steps created and also to facilitate easy movement in the courtyard. This was part of the works to make the project visitable for an extra 25,000 people. And this was uh, the intention uh, and part of the works that were produced, that were carried out at that time. Again, I hope you can follow the cursor and see where I am pointing to. This structure was included in the third courtyard. Um, it's stairs and a lift. That means that a visitor coming from the street can climb up and access the high level garden. A portion of the building um, front between the first two buildings, it was intended to build a bridge of glass and timber. This wasn't completed, but was part of the demands for museum-like circulation in the space. So uh, this is the building as surveyed uh, around the time. And this, I think, is, uh, oh yeah, uh, this is uh, one of the lines of visibility that ex uh, explained how mysterious and enchanting the building was, being able to see through two arches. 
Um, this is the proposed changes to the building, and I'm going to point to some of the things that uh, happened to make uh, that were proposed to make the building accessible internally. Actually, I better go back and explain a little more carefully here. The blue line represents cobbled external surfaces that are ramped and not level. Um, and that was the conventional way for gaining access to the building. When you think about presenting it as a museum environment, um, there's a sharper difference between interior and exterior. And these interventions are required to keep the envelope of the building weather tight and yet provide um, a means of accessing from one level to another, whether by means of steps and lifts um, or ramps. So quite a lot of interventions are required to make the building visitable. And it's interesting to note just what proportion of space in the medieval building is required for these interventions. One could almost say that had they all been built, the interventions would have dominated the space um, and detracted from its character. So in the particular instance, um, we can see, I think we can see uh, a space that was perhaps very important in terms of the historical understanding of the building, the bed chamber of the original builder, John Rolfe, and just how much things were put in that space um, to make the floors interlinked, a lift and the stairs. And these would take away from the original character of, of the building. So this is um, a quick run through of um, the way that a building is required to operate as a museum as a set of installations arranged in a line with a narrative thread and um, interpretive panels or items of interest along the way. And this is what re required the building of a bridge. Uh, I, again, I hope you can see my cursor. Uh, this is new intervention here um, that makes a circuit of a floor plate. The old building was U-shaped, not O-shaped. So um, the demands of accessibility make changes such as this um, obligatory, and that happened on two floors. So I tried, to, um, I tried to talk about accessibility in terms of narratives, of, of telling stories, of telling the history of a place, which is maybe not a single thing, but many overlapping and perhaps conflicting stories with gaps and unknowns in it. And this interpretation, um, I think, is a, a deeply important aspect of what we do when we present heritage places to the public. Even the acts of intervening to conserve are acts of interpretation. And um, the building has experienced two such acts of interpretation in the 1890s and in the 1960s. One by a well-intentioned um, middle-class owner trying to restore dignity and utility to a building that had been mired in poverty and neglect. The second in the 1960s attempting to restore some symbolic markers of um, medievalness and grandeur and majesty to a building because um, of its known associations uh, and symbolic value to the nation. But perhaps a gentler way of approaching all of this is to tell stories, to unravel for people verbally or perhaps with display boards um, what we think we understand about the past and how we might be wrong. <laughs> so um, here is one example from um, Roth House, from its frontage. Um, we know that 
many interventions over the years in the 1840s, in the 1890s and in the 1960s created this, uh, this set of spaces and this understanding of how that space might have been used. Um, we don't know if the arcade was continuous or was in, merely intended to be continuous from building to building or whether it was a space where shops reached out to the street front. Um, but we can talk about that. We can talk about um, the, the differences, the different possibilities and the different evidences that there are um, to support each of the individual stories. So I'm going to end with a provocative thought about one of the major words in modern conservation theory. Um, we have at the world heritage level, we have a test of authenticity and a lot of ink has been put on paper trying to describe what that is. Um, I've tried to explain in relation to this building just how complex and um, contradictory the evidence is and the pressures to make it accessible, um, all sorts of different logic supply. And um, I, think, I, I think that the, the concept of authenticity um, might be best explained if we use um, what I'm proposing as a new test of authenticity. Um, and that is, if the story we're telling remains true, even if it is simplified, as it inevitably will be by the passage of time, uh, then we can describe it as having an authenticity. There's a, a parallel concept of integrity, um, and I think that's a much more objective and easier concept to understand um, to do with the materiality of a building and whether it is indeed untouched, unchanged, or what has happened to it. Um, but I think that this test of authenticity helps to um, understand uh, a different aspect of a building and a place and what its story is. I hope I've made um, some small contribution to your conference uh, with this experience from Ireland. Um, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. And uh, according to our program, it's possible to ask questions if uh, are there. If uh, somebody has any question, may I ask you what happened uh, with the underground function? Because there is a very important cellar in that building. And uh, you didn't uh, uh, speak about the history garden, in the first uh, pictures you introduced the medieval garden and uh, is there any kind of uh, former uh, data about it or that is only the part of the exhibition and not the part of the restoration? Sure. Uh, I'm going to the um, point that describes the basement of the building uh, here, I hope you can see that now again. And um, yes, the basement is extremely interesting. Um, and if I had, if, if you were to give me a half an hour, I could um, describe its conundrums to you. In this drawing from the 60s, um, it is visible here. And um, here is the recess in the party wall that describes least the intention of connectivity between buildings along the street in the form of a covered arcade. And you note that the level of the sill of that um, arch is quite high in relation to the current ground level, the current street level. Uh, and when we look at this basement area here, which is only under the front building, um, it's one point meters high, no more. Um, 
However, if the floor was raised to this height here, we would have a slightly more substantial space. And uh, I must say as well that the floor of the basement from for as long as I have known this building has been concrete introduced in the 1960s. <laughs> and I'm not aware of any investigative archaeological process um, to understand how, how deep it was before the concrete was introduced. Um, we do have steps down from the street here that um, explain that it was accessible from the street at some point in its life. So, uh, one of the things that happened for the building to be noticed for the very first time in 1849 was um, making building accessible for a car or a cart. And I'm convinced that I have the evidence that um, explains that what was happening was that um, a continuous walkway along here was breached in order to create a continuous um, ground level from this courtyard to the street to allow cart to drive in and perhaps to allow muck and rain to drain out. And this has altered our perception of the building and of what the basements could possibly do. Um, so as it currently stands, the basement is a very uh, low level area used for storage and one private office for the uh, building uh, manager. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not uh, visitable by the public and its history is relatively poorly understood. It is part of the jigsaw puzzle of understanding how the building worked. We know when it was built that it was used for storage, um, perhaps of the mercantile goods that the um, owner traded in and which made him wealthy. Um, but after that, we know very little more about it. I hope it goes some way to explain um, what, what, we, what, was, um, what we had there. And about the garden. Sorry, say again. And about the garden. The garden. The garden. Ah. And also in relation to the levels of the building, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so the, the, the subdivision of the city into burgage plots and uh, is a part of its very early foundations from the... Um, 13th century. Uh, so a simple spine uh, route through the city, the walls built and the space between street and walls divided into narrow strips of land. And these um, were uh, laid across the topography, which clearly sloped from the city walls down to the street. So there's this quite different big change in level between the garden and the street. And um, there's a very large retaining wall at the end of the buildings, um, and the garden is above that, and the buildings and courtyards are below that. We don't know the um, time of building of that wall. Um, we don't know what period it dates from, but clearly it was in situ by the time in the 1600s that the um, third house was built. And so it exists from that time. And the, the change in level had to be negotiated from that time. After that, we know very little about it. Um, uh, 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 there's no um, good explanation, or no very strong logical explanation for why it should be like that. Thank you. Another question? No. We change because... Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Tamás Fejrdi. Thank you very much for your presentation. And... Uh, my question is going to the urban context, because uh, you, you were able to convince us that it's a very extraordinary building with a lot of uh, uh, values and a long history with many uh, changes. But my question was uh, maybe twofold. First is going to the, uh, the, the, the plot, the parcel. It's, it looks quite long, a very, very long parcel. And it is uh, usual in this context in the Kilkenny or it is exceptional for this part of the city. And the other point is that uh, 
I was really uh, amazed by by the story of uh, arches. Uh, this, uh, and and uh, do you have any other similar ex uh, examples of buildings in the, in, the, in in this context or in the neighborhood uh, of this uh, this very building? Thank you. Uh, that's they're, they're wonderful questions, and and I wish I had prepared um, slides because I have material that could perhaps visually explain some of these things. But in a funny way, the answer to the two questions is somewhat similar. Um, a, a city, a town, it is um, necessarily complex and internally differentiated, and also, and maybe most importantly, changes over time. Um, but what you have is this um, framework of land divisions and ownerships, separate ownerships, which once they're made, once the subdivision has been made, it's almost impossible to put them back together again. Yes, we have um, modern 21st and 20th century processes of land accumulation associated with wealth and property development and so on, and sometimes they have very damaging impacts on our cities and we can deplore them. But in fact, some of these processes have been happening for a long time through history in the 19th century. Um, and even perhaps at the time when Roth House was built, the width of the Burgage plot is wider than uh, the standard measure for Anglo-Norman um, early town development in Ireland, England, Wales and France. Um, so even John Roth, when he built his house, may well have been um, flexing his mercantile muscle and buying several properties to amalgamate, to make a grand house, a grand plot of land um, for his house, first of all. Um, uh, so sec and then secondly, this question about the, the narrowness of the burgage plots was to do with um, self-sufficiency. They were very definitely places where um, food was grown, animals were kept. We know John Roth had an orchard, uh, for example, and that's what, what has been reinstated um, in the last 15 years in that place and, um, and so on. So they were places where food was grown, um, where water was collected actually, that's important too. And um, th they, they were a little microcosm within the city um, to a degree self-sufficient. Uh, interestingly enough, and maybe this is important or it may help you as you approach Friday evening in Hungary, um, beer was brewed on the site as well. We have evidence of um, the brewing of beer and the uh, fermentation of corn and so on and I want to give you a prompt to have a beer tonight um, at the time the, the water from the ground may well have been contaminated um, they didn't know about how to treat waste and so on but beer was um, uh, distilled and cleansed in the distillation and therefore it was a healthier drink to drink than, than perhaps the ground water and so so if that gives you an excuse for indulging in a healthy, unhealthy activity this evening, I hope so. Um, now, the arcades, in a similar way, uh, were part of the, um, the urban ambition for Kilkenny, that it would be a, uh, a place that would be comfortable to use, to walk down the street, not to be in the rain. And um, many fragments of arcading survive across the city, but concealed behind plaster work or in the party walls of other shops and so on. There, yes, there are fragments, but they are not overt. And um, in early 17th century descriptions of the city, it is described as a city of arcades and, and of marble. The, the stone that the building is built of, it's a limestone, but it was uh, called marble. So it had a reputation as being this wonderful place of big buildings with comfortable arcades, shining marble, and so on. And, and that was part, perhaps, of its um, city branding in the, 17, in the early 17th century. So it, it was part of a picture, and the picture maybe has dissolved through historical time. Um, and I'm sure there are 
many stories, and I think there are European stories of urban evolution and development. Um, Kilkenny has been described in the Irish Historic Towns Atlas, a, a beautiful publication, which I think is matched by um, and in a similar format to many, many other publications across Europe. It's part of a, an international comparator project um, for European towns. So. Um, of other towns across Europe, and there's a rich um, study to be made of, of such um, uh, towns across Europe as well. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. It's great. Like I get, uh, it's just dreaming uh, on Kilkenny, like Bologna in Italy, with many arches. Uh, let's, let's say thank you very much. Yeah. Other question? As you. Hello. Before you ask your question, I must say I'm very disappointed not to be with you. I yeah. wish um, I could have made the journey to no, Hungary. <laughs> not more than we are. Maybe. So <laughs> that's it. Next time, maybe. Next time, maybe we, we, you can visit us. Okay. Uh, so my question okay. is: uh, I understood that it. Um, after after this restoration, it became uh, uh, an, a building which uh, can visited by by the general public. Um, and my question is whether inside or just outside of the building. Yeah. No. Um when the building was restored in the 1960s, um, it was for public um, accessibility. It was a small local museum. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, I... it has been such ever since. Um, it, it's another interesting question. When we think about museums in historic buildings, just how much uh, of the interior of a building is accessible um, it's there's always spaces that are not going to be presented. Um, it may be that they are offices, it may be that they are um, too small in scale, or that they're needed for the storage of exhibits. And it, it, it's um, it's an architect's observation. I, um, I, I'm not sure how many of the audience there are architects. Most of them. This, Most of this, them. Yeah, there's this tickle at the back of my head um, that if you're an architect and you design a building, um, every space has a function and you know what every space is intended to do in the totality, in the holism of the, of the building. And when you visit a building, you uh, have perhaps a subliminal expectation that you will be given access to every part of it as if you were sitting at your drawing board looking at a plan and that you have authority um, to access all areas. <laughs> okay. And of course, when you visit a building, this is not possible. Um, and I, I think this is an, an interesting observation and maybe something that people can take into their professional lives and see can they do anything with it. But um, there will, when you visit a building as a member of the public, there will always be things that you will not be able to understand and areas that you will not be able to access in relation to that building. And take Roth House, every single bit of it is historic and interesting and uh, perhaps some of the most fascinating evidences in some of the smallest spaces. So you have a conundrum of how to present things that are in places that are really awkward and on the other hand, how you can make those servant spaces to the served public areas uh, within the envelope of the building. And that's a very difficult problem and uh, one that was confronted in Roth House. But I think that's a more complex answer to your question than is deserved. Um, mm -hmm. It certainly is when you come to Kilkenny, um, you can come to visit Roth House. And it's a very interesting and enjoyable experience. Um, and as much of it as possible is shown to okay. the public. I will go, and I hope we shall go and visit Kilkenny, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Yes, bye. you're very welcome.
I, uh, may I ask another question? Because uh, it's uh, yesterday here was a great argue about the uh, traditional, uh, traditional heating and uh, ventilation and the others. And you have a very inter interesting and fantastic traditional building. And uh, in it, uh, 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 I'm using chimneys and, and uh, the traditional heating system. How could you handle this question? And uh, uh, what is uh, uh, this building for? Uh, who is this building for the, the uh, for the people from the 21st century? The restoration for the old traditional building or for the museum? And how could you solve this question in this building? Yeah. And what's your opinion about it? Oh, that is so difficult a question. I mean. In the first instance, um, the, the chimneys uh, were a part of the radicalness of the building when it was built. Um, at that time, it was also possible that people heated their buildings by lighting a fire in the middle of the floor and allowing the smoke to escape through a hole in the center of the roof. So even a fireplace was a, a major step forward in relation to comfort. In Rolf House, we have studied the fireplaces that survive, and there are 13. And uh, the distribution of fireplaces can be used as an indicator of the spaces that were inhabitable, intended to be comfortable, etc. Actually, some of them are associated with the industrial processes of making beer in, in parts of the building. The, Parts, some of them are associated with um, with beer making, and it's important also to identify the fireplace that was used for cooking, um, because that would have been different and special, larger, um, especially for a wealthy household. So the fireplaces um, are a really important um, surviving fact or form of evidence as to how the building was inhabited. Um, now. Coming forward to the 20th and the 21st century, we have higher expectations of comfort. And until the oil crisis of the 1970s, it was easy to provide a mechanical solution um, based on infinite supplies of oil and so on. Uh, and so I think central heating was um, installed in the building at that time. And now that comes up for questioning again. And um, a large part of my work at the moment in the Heritage Council is trying to understand how we can make our buildings use radically less energy than they do. Um, this is an important climate change issue. In fact, I'm sure as you can appreciate in Hungary, it's an acute political issue as well with the question about Russian oil. And um, I fully appreciate that's a very difficult uh, issue in, in Hungary at the moment. Um, but we're doing all we can to reduce the amount of energy that is being used in buildings. And um, so historic buildings are um, coming under pressure for them to be clad in insulation, to have insulation in the roof, etc., to have double glazed windows. Um, to reduce the amount of heat that is lost from them. And this is quite a difficult problem. I would very much like to see buildings use less energy, but not to lose their character in the process. And um, we reach for subtle, carefully designed, carefully thought out solutions where the impact is minimal. For example, there are um, insulating renders that are being developed at the moment, and um, you can perhaps remove a, a render that is depleted or perhaps full of cement and not quite fit for purpose and replace it with um, a render on the outside of the building that contains a fair amount of insulating properties. Um, you can introduce secondary glazing and so on. There are technical measures. You can have more efficient uh, services, um, the machinery that uses the energy can be made to work more efficiently and the distribution systems and so on. Um, there's a, two other strands that are important to this debate, in my opinion, and I hope I'm not going off topic in 
in this because I, I'm on a favorite subject here. <laughs> but two other stands to it, and one which reaches back to the history of these buildings. Um, and that is that um, when this building was built, and indeed up until the 18th century, buildings were not intended to deliver comfort to the people who use them. Comfort is a word and a concept that comes from the 18th century. Before that, the fittings in a building delivered status to the people who were in the building. So the size of your chair, your position on a bench, whether you had a bed, how far you were from the fireplace, all of these things were way more important in the way that people thought about buildings. They wore clothes um, of varying degrees of uh, layers to stay warm. And so sometime in the, after the Industrial Revolution, we began asking our buildings to provide comfort to us. And that is part of the process of industrial, industrialization and the exploitation of energy and the accelerated use of coal and then oil and so on. Um, so our expectations of comfort are part of our climate problem. And it is possible maybe to keep our buildings outside of that solution. Now that's quite a radical um, proposal. Um, and one that is very challenging to each of us as individuals who use buildings. I, I'm wearing a shirt. You're wearing a shirt. We're not wearing jumpers and coats. You, okay, it's summertime. But, you know, we don't think like this. We don't think um, that our clothing should provide us with comfort, not our buildings. And, uh, and, and maybe there's a... I'm stating a radical position there, but maybe we'll find some balance um, that's not so radical in thinking of an answer to this problem. Um, but there's, there's one other dimension to it. Um, the people who lived in medieval buildings also did what they could to um, improve their own comfort. And they used things like wall linings and curtains and rugs and so on to, um, to cover bare walls because bare walls themselves um, are, uh, what would you say, a sink for radiant heat from the human body. Um, and there are subtle ways, uh, if we care to look at the evidence, it may not survive in the fabric of buildings, but in, in documentation about how buildings were inhabited. Um, that can give us some clues as to how to comfort whilst using very little energy. Um, all of our old buildings did not use huge amounts of energy. Timber was... burned, uh, and perhaps in, to a limited extent, coal. But buildings were not major places where energy was used. And um, we may have to try and find our way back to these minimal energy usages in buildings and to provide ourselves with comfort in different ways that don't demand um, the use of fossil fuels. Now, I, hope that, <laughs> I hope I haven't gone off in a totally wrong direction in attempting to answer that, that question. Thank you very much. Uh, if uh, we have no uh, any other question, and we have a short break, thank you very much for your amazing presentation. And it's sorry to say, but we have no any Kilkenny red uh, beer to uh, to celebrate your fantastic presentation. But next time, perhaps. Thank you very much for your presentation.